The flamethrower starts out as a really good anti-personnel weapon for clearing trenches. If you pump flaming material into an enemy trench, what's the enemy gonna do? They're gonna get out of that trench and they're gonna get out right away. And then you can shoot them. The flamethrowers were ideal weapons to flush out enemy trenches. Both Allied and Axis powers began developing their own portable flamethrowers using the same basic design. They consisted of two containers, one containing fuel, the other compressed gas as a propellant. A hose led off from the fuel canister with two triggers, one to shoot the gun, the other to light the fuel. The uh, flame gun has three primary parts. You've got the rear valve. This releases the napalm or the diesel fuel or the, uh, the vaporous fuel down through the wand into the front trigger housing and the flame shield. When you pull the trigger, a pin is pushed through the ignition cartridge, igniting the incendiary. When you open the trigger to let the fuel out through the end of the nozzle where the flame is, you get a huge, loud whoosh. It burns for approximately 10 seconds. Contrary to what you see in the movies, they don't shoot for hours, they don't shoot for minutes, they shoot seconds. In World War I, flamethrowers proved fire could effectively destroy anyone in a dug-in position. Move forward to World War II and the Pacific. This concept proved just as effective. As the Americans conducted their island hopping campaign against the Japanese, they were confounded by the heavily protected bunkers and pillboxes which they found on most of the islands. Without access to heavy artillery, the U.S. Army needed a way to flush out and destroy the enemy. The answer, flamethrowers. Basically, you're using a flamethrower against somebody who is in a dug-in position where they can shoot out, you can't shoot into it, and basically you're going to be pouring uh, this burning uh, gasoline through the little hole in his pillbox uh, to burn them out. Each pillbox had a what we called apertures, or at least a slit in that pillbox, so that they could fire out of it. And that's what you tried to roll your flame through. The flame would go right through there and was very effective. February 23, 1945, Iwo Jima. Flamethrower Woody Williams was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor after single-handedly taking out seven pillboxes against the full force of the Japanese. And I can remember I'm crawling on my belly. And I remember them coming charging around the end of that pillbox toward me. There were five or six of them. And I just opened up the flame and caught them. It was just like they went from real fast running to real slow motion. But by getting rid of those seven pillboxes, that opened up a hole. So we got through. The Japanese were really scared to death of flamethrowers. The portable flamethrower created tremendous terror, but its fear factor was both a strength and weakness. While the enemy might surrender in the face of a flamethrower, they also tried to take it out as quickly as possible. The flamethrower was a prime target and very visible. The average life of a flamethrower was five minutes because he was a target that the Japanese wanted to get rid of very badly. The flamethrower had other limitations. Flamethrower's heavy, it doesn't carry a lot of fuel, it's only a few seconds of burn. It's a tool in the inventory. It's very useful in the situations where it works well, but it has distinct limitations. The small portable flamethrower had a limited range of 20 yards, which added to the risk for the operator. The small tanks also meant that they could carry only several gallons of fuel. Since you only had enough fuel to burn for seconds, you needed to be very precise and very close to your target. In 1944, one man had an answer to these problems, General Percy Hobart. Hobart designed a series of specialist tanks for the Normandy invasion. 
a floating tank, a bridge building tank, and the flame throwing crocodile. They were nicknamed the funnies, but you'd never smile at this crocodile. The crocodile took the British Churchill tank and replaced its hull machine gun with a flamethrower. A huge fuel tank was then placed in a trailer behind it so that the vulnerable fuel supply was kept separate from the tank operators. The crocodile tank, which was a British modified tank, was designed to go up against very well dug in German pillboxes on the Normandy coast and pump large quantities of flammable material into them and light it on fire. If you're up against a big chunky German pillbox, you just ruck up in your crocodile tank and you pour fire into her until, until everybody's dead. The crocodile's bite proved so effective that the rest of the world's military began building specialized flamethrowing tanks. And fire-breathing T-34s and Shermans entered the battlefield. With hundreds of gallons of fuel on board, they could rain down fire over rivers, through tree lines, and into buildings. They could shoot anywhere from 200 to 285 yards with a thickened fuel. They had a lot more capacity. We carry roughly four and a half gallons in these flamethrowers, and they carried hundreds of gallons. The mechanized monsters vastly improved the range and destructive power of the flamethrower. Shot from a flamethrower, fire could burn out an enemy from the deepest cave, trench, or bunker.